Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending January 28, 2017. And thank you, Tom, for the articles about Pluto and uh, the last article I'm going to talk about, about early Mars exploration. So let's get started. The first article here is from Fox News Air and Space. Beyond Pluto, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft heads to next adventure. You've probably seen all the articles about the stuff with uh, Pluto and the new high-resolution images, and we're going to still be downloading them for and examining them for uh, probably weeks and years to come. So nearly two years after its historic encounter with the dwarf planet Pluto, NASA's New Horizon spacecraft is getting ready for its next big adventure in the icy outskirts of the solar system. Now the spacecraft is on its way to a small ancient object located about one billion miles beyond Pluto and the Kuiper Belt. And this is uh, 2014 MU69, and besides the links to this article and all the articles I'm talking about, uh, uh, I'll put paste right below the Pluto article, the Wikipedia article talking about MU69. It's a small object, not even sure if it's perfectly round, somewhere between 20 and 30 miles wide. Now they have a small amount of fuel left in the Horizon spacecraft, just enough to do a little bit of maneuvering, so they're looking for objects that might be possibly interesting. It was kind of funny because they talked about there may even possibly be a planet out there the size of Mars somewhere in the area way beyond Pluto, but since we don't really know exactly where it is, we've got to go with what we actually know. And this is kind of weird because this is one of the first times that by uh, during the period that Horizons was traveling to Pluto, they were still searching for the next object so that they didn't waste the extra cost of the mission so that they could have something past Pluto to actually have the horizon do. So this is the first time they've actually done that where they've actually chosen a location while the craft was en route as far as like a new location to go to. And uh, But this is going to be another thing too. The farther it's away, the, the longer it's going to take to get information back and forth. And uh, um, it says right here, it took the spacecraft about 16 months to beam back all of its data from the Pluto fly flyby, and planetary science has had a ball with that data. The New Horizons flyby of the Pluto system was completely successful, and now we have all the data on the ground, and we're putting a bow around it. Uh, let's see what else here. Anything else uh, significant here? No, this is just going on more about Pluto. But anyway, you can check out from Wikipedia. It shows you the picture that they got from the, uh, I believe that's from the Hubble Space Telescope that they've got of what they, of the best picture that they have actually of what uh, the uh, object MU69 would look like. And so, uh, yeah, check it out if you get a chance. Um, this is this is an article about, uh, they were talking about on this other site, the original article that I that I picked out has been pulled down. It was from another Canadian site, but it was about a newer cure for MS, multiple sclerosis, and it was pulled down from the site. So uh, I noticed I could still Google and get the link to the site, and it was from notable.ca, so I had to go to a different place. I had to go to mclean's.ca, and I kind of think the reason why, too, but because it's not really a cure for MS. It's not like your average MS patient's going to be able to use this, but for a very small percent, like 5% of the patients that have MS, this is a distinct possibility, and what it is, it's a reset of your immune system. They, they take and uh, preserve some of your immune system um, out of your bone marrow and then they basically kill off the rest of the bone marrow with chemotherapy and radiation and then inject your own um, uh, marrow back in to be able to maybe do a reboot on your immune system but also there's uh, they've also had patients die going through this test too so uh, even if you do end up being one of that five percent you stand a pretty good chance of not making it through this either. You'll either make it and it'll probably cure you or you might, the, the procedure itself may be so hard on your body that you may end up dying from it. So you've got to kind of watch it, especially when anything comes from Facebook or any social media telling you about this great numerical cure. And especially like me, if you have friends, I've got several friends that have MS or other diseases related to MS too. And you always are hoping that some kind of cure will be found that'll, uh, you know, be good for um, the majority, you know, more than 50% of the people, but a lot of these breakthroughs are just small percentages here and there, but um, that's not to be dismissed either. I mean, if they if they take it a few percent at a time and they maybe find something else that'll help another 5 or 10% and keep knocking away and knocking away at it, you know, so uh, there was a person on this trial, in fact, in this clinical trial trial protocol, there was a person that died, they didn't, they said they're not going to release this name, so in a sample size of 24 patients, um, one of the patients died that went through this treatment. So, yeah, 
very dangerous, very cutting edge and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I suppose it's up to each person to decide, you know, is it worth the risk if you're a, a candidate or something like that. I remember having to sign that uh, uh, when I went under anesthetic just to even get my uh, cataracts removed. I had to sign a paper saying I realized uh, so many percent, I think it was one out of every 100,000 people that just take the anesthetic um, for the surgery end up dying just from that. Did I understand that clearly? And, you know, they made sure I read it and understood it and signed it. Uh, before I started the procedure, so everything has its risks. This one's from the Washington Post, uh, and it's, this one's been discussed too. There was uh, Dave Nicholson and uh, and I also public, both uh, um, uh, posted some uh, articles similar to this. Scientists create a part human, part pig embryo, raising the possibilities of interspecies organ transplants. Uh, Dave Nicholson's one too on uh, the Facebook Dumpster Divers page was talking about growing organs in pigs, not so much making a, a part human, part pig, but it says here, for the first time scientists have grown an embryo that is part pig, part human. The experiment described Thursday in the journal Cell involves injecting human cells into the embryo of a pig, then implanting the embryo in the uterus of a sow and allowing it to grow. After four weeks, the stem cells had developed into the precursors of various tissue types, including heart, liver, and neurons, and a small fraction of the developing pig was made up of human cells. The human pig hybrid, dubbed the chimera for the mythical creature of the lion's head, a goat's body and a serpent's tail, was highly inefficient, the researchers cautioned, but it's the most successful human animal chimera and a significant step towards development of animal embryos from functioning human organs. I don't have a lot of problem myself with um, using human stem cell tissue for like say a heart or a kidney or a gallbladder or a liver or something like that and then using a pig to grow that human tissue but then when you're talking about actually mixing up human embryos and pig embryos boy I don't know that's the creep factor just goes way up for me but if you want to think about it and uh, have a comment you know use the comments below and discuss and see what you think about it I mean uh, just because science can do everything, and they probably will pretty much do everything they can possibly do, is it always the best thing for them just to go ahead and do it? Uh, we're not going to stop them, I know, but, you know, I don't know. kind of creeps me out a little bit. And last up, this is a YouTube video. This is from U.S. National Archives. I've actually watched quite a few, and I, I go to U.S. National Archives for a lot of old newsreels and stuff like that from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And this one's called Eight Months to Mars. And it's really funny because it's back in the early 60s when we sent our first probe to Mars, and they were still there was a lot of conjecture about what Mars could possibly be like. They were still talking about, and I remember in, as a kid in grade school, they were talking about the canals on Mars. Later on now, we realize it's just an optical illusion by the because of the telescopes and the way the optics were on the telescopes, but people genuinely believed there was a canal on Mars, and they said it was not. People really thought that it would be more than likely if we landed a probe on Mars, we would see some type of plant life at the very least, if not animal life, and it, we just accepted that. And it's kind of funny in this uh, Eight Months to Mars video, you'll see the guy talk about that scientists were already speculating that when they get there, the type of snow that would be on Mars would be like uh, table sugar, and he even has his little cup of coffee. I'll, I'll put the 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 thumbnail of the video up here that I've got a screen cap of and he's got his little cup of coffee and he takes the cup and, and he's, he's standing on a, a, a artist's rendering of Mars and he takes his little cup of coffee and sticks it in the, the sugar snow and uh, adds sugar to his coffee. And they also have a classic, uh, I think it's a 64 Mustang convertible that they use as an example for a different, to explain to people how a probe works and the different parts of the car functioning versus the different parts of the uh, probe that's going to Mars and how it functions. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.